Welcome to Let's Hear It. Let's Hear It is a podcast for and about the field of foundation and nonprofit communications, produced by its two co hosts, Eric Brown and Kirk Brown. No relation. Well said, Eric, and I'm Kirk. And I'm Eric. The podcast is sponsored by the Communications Network and the Lumina Foundation. We're talking to people about their work and what's happening in the field with the hopes of making this growing arena just a little bit more accessible to us all. You can find Let's Hear It on any podcast subscription platform. You can find us on Twitter at Let's Hear It Cast, and you can email us at hello at Let's Hear It Let us know if you have any thoughts about what you hear today, including people we should have on the show. And if you like the show, please, please, please rate us on Apple Podcasts so that more people can find us. So let's get on to the show. And we're back. Welcome in. It's another Let's Hear It. Glad you found us. Kirk Brown. Glad you're here. Mr. Brown, glad you're here. How you doing, Eric? You know what this is? This is the beginning, I think, if I'm not entirely mistaken, and heaven knows I might be, of season five? Oh, it might be. It's either season- Is it season- Is it season it five? It might be season four. I'm not sure. Might we're going <laughs> to have to go back and check. <laughs> They're all blurring together this week. It's season something. But it's a fresh season. It's season something of, of and 70- 70 something episodes of let's and clearly we have How we have that? our own schedule for doing this and the schedule is what is which i think is right that's the right way to do it the right way to think we're of doing it. the the best we can which is more than enough i think it's more than enough <laughs> so yeah well congratulations eric you've had a lot of good ideas in your career but this is by far the best doing let's hear it was by far <laughs> your best you're, you're, total inspiration this, this, the, the, <laughs> the, the king of passive aggression <laughs> Make your crazy idea. Make some, make some other schmo think it was his so that he somehow manages to adopt it without realizing that he has been snookered. Yes, it was my great idea, Kirk. Yeah, all right. Maybe in season you, 11. Of, let's hear it. Right, because you could never stop. Once you get it started, you could never stop. So It's a joy to see you again, my friend. Great to see you again and great to listen to this conversation. This is a very appropriate way to start the season, whatever season this is. This is a really great discussion, and take us into this because this is a this is an outstanding way to kick things off. There's gonna, this is going to set the stage, I think, for a lot of conversations this year. Actually, I spoke with Jacob Harold, who is the author of the, a truly painful and wonderful new book called <laughs> "The Toolbox: Strategies for Crafting Social Impact," published by Wiley, and hot off the presses. And Jacob Harold was the CEO of GuideStar, mm -hmm. and then he was the executive vice president of Candid when it merged with the Foundation Center. And he is a former colleague of mine from the Hewlett Foundation, where he was he ran the uh, philanthropy, or he, he was a program officer in the philanthropy program. Jacob is one of the most thoughtful, intelligent, deep, deep, deep thinkers in a good way about philanthropy and the nonprofit sector. And he took his however many decades of experience and he rolled it into this really interesting new book about how do you, what are the tools that encompass or what are some of the tools? And he, in our conversation, he acknowledged that there's a lot more tools, but these are the nine that he focused on to make social change. And we had what... Uh, like the many conversations that we had in the hallways of the Hewlett Foundation, uh, I think a fun and interesting and freewheeling conversation about how do you make change? You can find Jacob at jacobherald.com, where you can actually go and download the book and even download a free preview of it if you want to there. And you can find Jacob on Twitter if you're still hanging out in that space at Jacob C. Harold. Uh, this is terrific. Jacob Harold is a true... I think giant at this point in our field. He's done so much good and interesting work. And Jacob, thank you for coming on. Let's hear it. And Eric, thank you for doing this. This is a great conversation. So we'll listen and we'll come back and talk. This is Jacob Harold on Let's Hear It. Welcome to Let's Hear It. My guest today is none other than Jacob Harold. Jacob is an author, a social change strategist, and most recently co founder and executive vice president of Candid. Before that, he was the president and CEO of GuideStar, and now he is the author of an amazing, and I'm not making this up, new book called The Toolbox, Strategies for Crafting Social Impact, published by Wiley, hot off the presses, Jacob Harold. Thank you so much for coming on. Eric, it is great to be here. It has been 
too long since you and I have sat down to plot and scheme. I was thinking probably been a decade. <laughs> you now have gray hair. I have gray hair on my head and my beard. <laughs> I have less on my head. So time has passed, but, but here we are. Here we are. And you have, I've been told, you've been sitting in a room for three the last three years, and you're finally now. I'm relearning how to talk. Um, I mean, you know, like all of us, I've been home a lot since the pandemic. Um, you know, I also had the complexity of the merger, which just led to shifting where I was at any given moment, which team I was working with, what I was working on. And then for the last 10 months, I've been sitting in this room writing and marketing the book. So I'm, I'm re-remembering how to talk to people. <laughs> That's, well, you know, I think there's no better place to learn how to talk to people than on a podcast. <laughs> because, you know, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> oh, oh, uh, another thing that I did not mention in the open is that the Nonprofit Times named you to its Power and Influence Top 50 list seven years in a row. That is awesome amount of power and influence. What did that feel like? Did you get a different, they send you a little different thingy every year and do you have them on the shelf? So <laughs> I do have, you know, a little, what are they made out of? Lucite, a little Lucite sculpture from each year. I have not unpacked them from the oh. my old candid office. Whoa. Um, I'm not sure if my wife wants them displayed in our house. I got you know, like, this, okay, so that's power and influence. <laughs> You're so powerful and influential that you don't even need to unpack the Lucite Award. If like if I got well, one, so if I got one for 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 let's hear it. Let's just say I, I would I would probably I would have multiple copies made and and have them put all around the house. Because that would be, I, I'd support that. Some of them are better than others. I would say <laughs> that would be a visible sign of grace. Actually, when Paul Brest, our former boss at the Hewlett Foundation, mm -hmm. when he got his, I think I stole it, and I would, <laughs> I would, I put my name on it, and then, like, if I had someone on my team I liked, I would put their name on it, let them hold it, and that's so you know, it was. <laughs> I, I thought it was kind of nice to be able to to share power and influence. That, that, I mean, that was generous of Paul. And I, I will say, though, speaking of your team changing the names of things, one thing uh -oh. that I remember from our time at Hewlett <laughs> yes. was, you know, people would call and ask Paul Brest to speak at a conference or be on a panel. And Paul would be busy, of course, because he was president of a multi-billion dollar foundation. He would say, oh, let's send Jacob. And, you know, this happened over and over and over again <laughs> until your colleague, Megan, made me new business cards where she changed my title to Constellation Prize. <laughs> Everything else was the same, same email, same phone number, but really Jacob is the Hewlett Foundation Constellation Prize. Jacob Harold, Plan B. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I think that those people probably got a very nice Constellation Prize. I, I hope so. I hope so. Uh, so I want to talk about this book. You've been around the block, uh, as where you were at Bridgespan, you were at the Hewlett Foundation as a, as a grant maker, then you went on to be CEO at GuideStar. And then you talked about the merger with Foundation Center, which became candid. Again, I'm sure you saw all aspects of that, the business of nonprofits and, you know, so many different angles at it. And you are a thinker of big thoughts. And I know, I know this for a fact because I ended up inheriting your office on which there was a whiteboard that had the wall of wall of thinking, I believe it was. And little mm -hmm. did I know at the time that that wallow thinking would end up being synthesized into a book that made my head hurt. And I say that with, with uh, th maybe the highest compliment I can pay something. If it makes my head hurt, that's actually a good thing. There's a, maybe some kind of, I don't know, psychologists might have enjoyed uh, looking <laughs> into that. But you've written a book about what, what you call strategies for crafting social impact that combine, to my mind, uh, what you've learned over the years is that <laughs> is that a fair assessment it, i mean it absolutely is and you know my the particular course of my career has been unique in some ways and one is that i've just been really blessed to get to see a lot of ways of thinking about creating good i worked as a community organizer i studied complex system science in china um, i went to business school and then when we were at the hewlett foundation we were so lucky because we would have a world famous behavioral economist come and give a talk at lunch. Sendel Mullenathan. Exactly. 
And then I remember that. And when you got into your your chapter on behavioral economics, I went I went straight to it. Okay, sorry, I interrupted. Keep talking because you're. But but sort of somewhere. exactly right. And then and then you know you and the communications team ran these great communications trainings, and Andy Goodman would come and tell us about storytelling. And then you know the next week, someone would come in with a, you know a great analysis of new mathematical models for thinking about social change. And then we would cross the street, go over to Stanford and hang out at the design school. And we were just so lucky to get to experience these different ways of thinking about doing good in the world. And not everybody had that privilege. And so I, I wanted to share that. But there's a, there's a twist to all this, though, which is that even as I was so excited and, and blessed to get to see all these different approaches, I was also frustrated that so many people in philanthropy had their one thing and they viewed everything through that one lens. And it just doesn't work. The world's too complicated for that. We need multiple lenses. And, and so I simultaneously wanted to celebrate these tools as a group while also gently criticizing those who only look through one uh, view of the world. It's funny because I was thinking, I was looking at, I was looking at the book and I was looking at the chapter hangs like, where's communications? And then I started reading like, ah, I'm busted. Um, <laughs> And it's, <laughs> but the other thing is okay. Then here's how I redeem myself and my ilk, uh, which is that communications flows through everything that you are talking about in your book. And and perhaps if you don't mind, I'm just going to run down the list of things. Great. Yep. Because we won't, certainly won't have time to get to them all. But you have chapters associated with the following subjects or approaches, I guess you could say, or tools. Storytelling, mathematical modeling, which that made my head hurt, but not in a good way. Uh, there are a lot of formulas that I didn't understand. Behavioral economics, design thinking, and I have things if I have feelings about that, community organizing, game theory, which I found fascinating, markets, complex systems, and institutions. And what you have done in such an amazing way is to help us all understand the roles that each of these things or approaches plays in social change. And I, like I said, we won't go through all of them, but to my mind, I believe that understanding what it is you're trying to achieve, who it is, if they do the thing that you are hoping that they do, you will feel good or you will feel like you got closer to your goal what those people care about, or in some instances, the people who represent institutions. How do we communicate or get to those people in one way or the other? That's what communications is to me. And to, so it feels to me like communications flows through each of the aspects of, of oh, the components of, of your book. So then I felt better. So, so. <laughs> and that's right. And, it's, not, and it's, it's more than just communications that flows through. I would say ethics flows through. And there's a chapter before the tool chapters about ethics. Yeah. I would say leadership flows through. Um, and then, you know, strategy sort of writ large flows through. And there's a there's a chapter on on strategy where we talk about questions like, you know, who's your target and can you can you be clear? How do you learn along the way, et cetera? Right. Um, so there are these sort of cross cutting uh, elements in addition to these tools. And one thing that's important is that you know, nobody can wrap their mind around all nine tools all the time for every situation. It, it, it's a it, it's a menu that we can choose from according to what's most relevant for what we're trying to accomplish. There are some core things that we can't give up on, like clarity, like compassion, like having the courage to actually have some ambition, but the humility to recognize that we're not going to be able to know all the answers. Those things are not negotiable. But what, it, what we can be flexible about is what's the mental model we use for how the world works or what is the best leverage point for achieving the change we want to see. Well, you have this quote in here, which either I think you might have been cribbing from Yoda, although the syntax is a little too good. You say, if you have a goal, but no logic, you have only you have only desire. If you have resources, but no logic, you have only potential. If you have logic, but no goal, you are only a machine. Strategy is the logic we use to allocate our resources to achieve a goal. Was that Yoda? Did you take that from Yoda? I, I you know, I'm, I'm sure I was subconsciously influenced by Yoda. <laughs> I have been for many, many decades. But no, that that, that was just my that was my framing. <laughs> it, I, it, I may ink it on my arm or something like that. Like, I mean, 
<laughs> Thank you. It, I, I would be honored. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so although you say that so strategy is the logic we use and yet you say that strategy is a component of social change, but not the I don't know, it is it is not the, the, the central organizing principle per se. Is that correct? And can you kind of locate strategy in the context of your entire view of yeah. I mean, so, you know, the definition I have of social change is work we do to make a better world, which is a very general definition, but, you know, it, I think it actually captures the essence of it. Strategy is how we do that, is the logic that we use to organize our activities or our resources to actually achieve the goal. And, and that's the thing. There's a lot of social change that is work to make a better world that doesn't get anything done. It's still work. It's not impact, but it's work. Right. And, you know, without that logic, I think you might get really lucky, but usually, you know, you're not going to get that far. Uh, were there things that you considered that you did not include? Oh, for sure. What, yeah. Ways of approaches to work and things like that and why? I mean, so, um, and there, there are a bunch of them that I ended up including in various ways, but they did, I didn't call them their own tool. So uh, military strategy is, you know, Throughout human history, there's probably been more attention on military strategy than maybe any other kind of strategy. You know, art comes up throughout, but I, that could deserve its own chapter for sure. Um, uh, religion and sort of contemplation could deserve its own chapter. And then some of these cross-cutting things like, like evaluation or communications, I think absolutely could. So, you know, I'm already kind of thinking, you know, could there be a sequel where I have, you know, another set of tools. Another one that I thought about having as a, sort of an independent tool, but instead I tried to weave through was basically, for lack of a better term, critical race theory, but really more broadly, just applying an understanding that identity matters in politics and in, and in life, you know? So, so there's, and I would, I encourage readers and everyone to add their own tools. The book is systematic, but it's not comprehensive. So you're already thinking about the second album. I'm thinking about the second all album. The, all the, songs the sophomore there. effort. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I'm not at all surprised that you wrote this book. I could see back in the day, even early on, before you were a big shot CEO, the wheels were turning. But was there a moment where you realized that the that the the gears had fit into place, that that you now had what you thought you needed in order to try and pull this together into a single approach? So, you know, the interesting thing is I first wrote a proposal for this book when I was at Hewlett. Not surprised. Before I was a CEO. And it, and, and so I had the basic framework and the idea. What I didn't have was the time. And I didn't maybe yet have the confidence to put it down as definitively as I maybe wanted to. So, you know, going through the almost decade of, be, of being CEO of GuideStar and, and helping to start Candid, you know, gave me a lot of that kind of trial by fire, I guess, but it also gave me the time and, you know, towards the end, towards the very end, you know, I had more flexibility at Candid to get to really start writing. And then this year, once, you know, I was a full-time writer, but it's been percolating for a long time, you know, and, and I think that actually, on the one hand, I wish I could have, you know, gotten it published 10 years ago, but on the other hand, I think it made it better that I've been thinking through and kind of massaging the ideas for a long time. Well, I want to, we're going to take a very quick break and be back with Jacob, Jacob Harold in the second half. We'll talk about uh, a million questions. We'll see if we can see how many of them we can get out. But we'll be right back with Jacob Harold. You're listening to Let's Hear It, a podcast about foundation and nonprofit communications hosted by Kirk Brown and Eric Brown. Let's Hear It is sponsored by the Communications Network, which connects, gathers, and informs the field of leaders working in communications for good. Because foundations and nonprofits that communicate well are stronger, smarter, and vastly more effective. You can find Let's Hear It online at letshearitcast.com or on Twitter at Let's Hear It Cast. Thanks for listening. And now back to the show. And we are back with Jacob Harold, the author of The Toolbox Strategies for Crafting Social Impact and former CEO of GuideStar, former co founder of Candid my former colleague at the Hewlett Foundation, uh, Jacob, before the break, I mean, you were talking about, about how you, these ideas had been percolating for 10 years, but in, in the book, you also kind of recognize the, as you say, the sort of the narrow sightedness of, of having a, a particular investment and a particular strategy. You said that you had fallen into some of those traps when you were at Hewlett. 
So in, in a sense, perhaps it's a good thing you didn't write it back then. But can you talk just a little bit about where you felt you what what you learned in that in the period since then? Like at the time, you I think you were really excited about behavioral economics, for example, and saw that as a really important tool, which it is. But what, where did you start to see that we have a fixation on particular strategies that <laughs> that that can narrow our view and limit our opportunity for for achieving real change. I mean, the truth is I first saw that um, right after college when I worked as a grassroots organizer. And, you know, there was a, a philosophy, a, almost an, a strategic ideology within the particular community of organizations I was w working in that this was the way to make social change. You organize power and you pressure those who have have power to do things better. And I'm convinced that's one of the most important mechanisms of social change. One of, and you know, history certainly plays that out. But it was also clear to me as a 21 year old that I wasn't the only one. Um, so you know, I, that I think that vampire like character of being afraid of silver bullets, you know, had been around for a while. And then when I was at the you know the 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 privileged position of being at a foundation where lots of people are coming and making their pitches. You can, you begin to see the pattern of you know everyone has their one their one frame, and then I saw it reflected in the airport bookstore, where you know <laughs> every book is like the one thing you know the one new lens, um, and you know they're just not very synthetic. They're, it's very much like here's the the one thing as opposed to here's the many things in a complex world. Um, but it wasn't in some ways until I was a CEO, where I I really saw the you know, the rubber hit the road in two ways. One, as a CEO, you're kind of in charge of everything and nothing. And it is, the only way you can succeed is if you are weaving together a variety of different skill sets and different approaches across the functional areas of an organization. Um, and so that was just kind of very practical every week when we'd have a leadership team meeting and, you know, you've got operations and technology and finance and program talking about the different aspects of the work, bringing their own lenses. So that's one. And then two is that unlike at a foundation, when you're running an organization, you, you kind of don't have excuses when things don't go wrong and you can't kind of dodge some of that responsibility in quite the same way that we, of course, would never do at the Hewlett Foundation, but certainly not. But other other foundations, you know, have certainly been accused of um, being the least accountable institutions in American society, that being both their greatest strength and their greatest weakness. But, you know, a, an operating nonprofit, especially one like GuideStar that was relying on earned revenue for the bulk of its income, it just has to deal with reality, you know? And reality does not yield to overly simplistic frameworks. I would love to get a sense of what you think of philanthropy once you stepped out of it, stepped out of the inside of the whale. And where do you see, I mean, right now we're having a, a great big debate. I mean, we've always had this debate about the, the role of philanthropy and in many senses, how overprivileged it is. But have you taken it? Have you learned anything new about philanthropy from not working inside a foundation? I'm sure I have. I, I I don't know if I can distill that into a simple answer. What I can say is, you know, my experiences working with foundations since I left one have been mostly positive. Um, you know, there have been a few cases where I spent a whole lot of time and wasted a lot of you know staff energy pursuing something that was just a total waste of everyone's time. But for the most part, you know. The folks I work with are really trying their best, often very smart. They're making connections. They're providing capital. They're trying to get better. I mean, the fact that the foundation community really changed the way it did grant making during the early part of the pandemic, um, shifting a lot of project grants to general operating support, you know, releasing other kinds of operational restrictions, was just a sign of the, the, the community is trying to do better and is willing to move, usually it's too slow, but it is capable of that kind of change. And similarly, I think the the way that the racial reckoning has shown up in philanthropy and the way it has made its way through different institutions and forced a recognition of historical patterns of, of injustice, I, I think it's really healthy. That doesn't mean we're done, but like at least I think we're showing a sense, a possibility of improvement. So, I, you know, I'm still on team philanthropy. I'm still pro philanthropy. I, <laughs> uh, I am. Yes, I kind of figured. Um, I wasn't trying to get you to say something nasty, uh, I promise. But, you know, that, that doesn't mean that we can't both, you know, point out the places where philanthropy really needs to do better. Um, 
And, you know, that to me is also separate from a broader question about inequality in society, which philanthropy ends up being a consequence of. I don't really think it's a cause of that inequality, but it is definitely a consequence of it. And it ends up intertwined with, with you know, the very real issues of inequality and in particular wealth inequality. So I mean, we have to address those things um, and we have to go faster. Um, and there are a lot of things I wish philanthropy would do better, but I am further convinced of the goodness of philanthropy. <laughs> okay, that was a nice answer. Well, well done. When you were, again, I was, I'm, I'm just looking right now at the, at the list of things that you, that you have devoted a lot of time to. Do you see a, a, how they fit together? I mean, this probably isn't even a fair question, but it, to your mind, is there a, a way to bring all these things together or do you just, are they just tools? Learn, take them for what they are, take them in and, and let them play out however you however you might synthesize them? Or do you or do you see things fitting together in a certain way or potentially in a certain way? I mean, the short answer is no, I don't. I, I just think the world is too complex. It's changing too fast. There's too much ambiguity and volatility around us for anyone to have the perfect blueprint, for anyone to see how it all fits together. If we acknowledge that reality, we can either throw up our hands and say, oh, well, we're screwed. Or we can say, and yet we have this abundance of ways of thinking, of ways of acting, of, of resources, of people, of history, of culture that we can work with. And, you know, that to me is exciting, is even more exciting in a way. So it, it, it's, it's not a hopeless statement that, no, I don't have a blueprint. I don't think anyone does. Um, in fact, it's a hopeful statement that what we do have are tools and that is enough. I mean, and, and history has shown this over and over again, that's enough to transform things. And now we have more tools and we have more clarity around them. And we have millions and millions and millions of people who are employed full time to make a better world. And like, how amazing is that? You know, in the nonprofit <laughs> sector, but also in government, also in the business world. And like, we as a society have figured out how to make it a profession to make the world better. And, you know, that is this incredible victory that humanity has somehow wrung out of history. And we haven't celebrated it. But it's hard because, you know, there's people, millions of people like us who've made this a career. And yet, you know, we still have tr trouble explaining our job at Thanksgiving dinner. Um, <laughs> there's no kind of professional name to describe what millions of people do. My hope is that now that that's solidified, we can begin to solidify, you know, some of the techniques just as, you know, people have figured out how to be good doctors over the centuries. Uh, people have figured out how to be good carpenters over the centuries. And, you know, I think whatever you call this work that we do, whether we are social change agents or social change professionals or whatever, I, I'm pretty unsatisfied with all the terminology that, you know, it is a, it's not just a calling, it's a job and there are ways to do it better. The solution to the Thanksgiving problem is just have Thanksgiving with your coworkers. <laughs> Maybe I should try that. Yes. Don't invite your parents. Don't invite... <laughs> I've told the story a million times. My father-in-law called over to HP once when Meg Whitman was installed as CEO because he wanted to ask me about my new boss. And they told him that Eric Brown didn't work there. And he called my wife and said, I think your husband's been fired. Exactly. One of my favorite stories of brand confusion. <laughs> Another imponderable question that you will answer better than I asked. How do you think people should or could use this book? Well, one, I would say this could be the first book that someone reads about social change strategy, but it's probably going to be the second. You know, it's probably going to be the third. <laughs> it is more sophisticated but that's because I believe people can be sophisticated and that humans are fully capable of at least trying to wrap their minds around complexity, not doing it perfectly, but doing a good enough job to get stuff done. So what I would hope is that people would read it and seed their minds with ways of thinking that will show up in ways that they can't necessarily predict. One thing I would urge people not to do is read the book and think, I have to apply everything in this, all nine tools all the time. That's impossible. Instead, I'm trying to think about how to launch this new program, and I'm pretty sure that behavioral economics and mathematical modeling are going to be the two things that really matter. Or it's really going to be about storytelling and complex systems. And, you know, to, to use those to help to guide you. Um, and I'm actually built, I'm writing up a field guide right now to help people. That's sort of a series of worksheets, essentially, to apply this. Um, but I also think, you know, and we learned this from the psychologists who would show up at the Hewlett Foundation, that it is possible to seed the mind with ideas that show up later um, and that we have to seed our minds with 
ideas from strategy um, if we want to ta tackle complex problems. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I, it, as I was reading this, I was thinking, this is, A, it's a great textbook for social change, a course on social change. If there are any professors out there, <laughs> get the book and you'll see it will do a lot of your work for you because it'll help you teach your course. It can help you teach any one of these courses uh, of the nine, but but uh, certainly in social change, uh, helping to understand how these pieces might fit together in, in the context of a particular strategy, for example. Uh, the other thing that I was thinking that I've never done mood altering acid or anything like that, but I think microdosing uh, some kind of uh, psilocybin or something like that and reading the mathematical modeling <laughs> chapter might be an, an interesting and entertaining <laughs> exercise. And maybe there's a way to just <laughs> microdose the book, you know, just read one chapter. <laughs> Like you try to have a hit of Mickey Mouse acid and what, and look at the the symbols on the mathematical modeling page come to life, and maybe they'll make a picture, and then you will see God, and that will be that. So I think that there are some potentially some uh, applications to this book that you have not yet contemplated, but that might be one. Of them. Like I said, I've never done that, but if if I were to do it, that would be. I think that's how I would do that. As as we kind of wrap up here, most of the folks listening, or many of the folks listening, are communications people. But almost everybody is working on social change in one one way or the other. If there are a couple of lessons that you would leave people with, maybe they're inside the book, but maybe they're just the product of your many decades in in this business. What what do you tell them? How do you mentor people who come to you and say, "I, I just I'm I'm curious to learn more. What do I need to know? Or how can I approach my work to make the best of it?" Um, I mean, I, I, sort of off the top of my head, a few things I'll mention. One is just the image of a spiral. I, and I talk about this in the strategy chapter, but it's not just, you know, a circle of learning and doing. It's a spiral that's going somewhere. And that, um, you know, it's very helpful to imagine that point at the end of the spiral and to hold on to that goal tightly, but to hold on loosely to how you're going to get there and to be ready for that that ride um, and, and to know that that's possible. That, that's one thing I'd mention. You know, another is to take some solace in the fact that there are now millions of people whose job it is to make the world better. Um, and that, you know, we're not alone. And in fact, society is empowering us in some pretty cool ways. And then third, and this is sort of riffing off of the values that GuideStar adapted just a bit, is it, it just alliteration, forgive the alliteration, but courage, compassion, collaboration, curiosity, clarity. If you bring those C words to your work, and those are both moral and strategic, right? You know, a word like clarity is, it's somewhat moral, but it's really more a, a strategic word, same for collaboration um, and curiosity. And, and But then that's infused with the kind of moral power of compassion and courage. I, I just kind of think we can't go wrong in a way, but you, you, this is one place where you do need them all. Like if you are not curious enough to want to learn new ways of thinking, to hear what your constituents have to say, you're going to run into a wall. And if you're not courageous enough to try and do something meaningful, you're not going to accomplish anything meaningful. And if you're not compassionate, you're a jerk. And if you're not, <laughs> and if you're not clear, you're just going to confuse everyone around you. And if you're not collaborative, then you're probably not going to get anything done because the world's too complicated to get much done alone. And so those five C's are, to me, those are must haves. Which of the nine tools you want to apply? You know, that's up to you and your sense of the moment. Well, I have to say, Jacob, that you are each one of those C's. I, 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 and I mean that sincerely. You are. I am not just blowing smoke because because you have been uh, one of the most thoughtful and and caring colleagues of mine over the years. And I'm not at all surprised that if you were to tie it up into a nice little bow, that that's how you would do it. I I really appreciated this book. I'm going to go back and read it a few more times because it is is one of these things like a lot of things that you learn over, over the years, you, you have to spend some time with it. And I had to read it really fast in order to interview you. <laughs> so it's possible I didn't go as deep as I, I might have, but it, it's really terrific. It really does in many ways bring together all of the things that I've learned over the years. And so I was so excited to have a chance to talk with you about it. And I'm really excited to share this with folks out there because it there there is something in there that will absolutely positively help you do your work better and to make the world a better place, as they say on Silicon Valley. So thank you. Well, thank you. I don't know if you saw, but your influence is in there in various <laughs> ways. 
Uh, is it now? I mean, uh, and, and, uh, you know, the one thing we didn't talk about, and I know you're trying to wrap up, is, you know. That, no, it's okay. We, we, we have electrons are cheap. Yeah. Is that, you know, it's full color. It has photography. It's got lots of diagrams. There's a, you know, clear color coding for the nine different tools. You know, visual design is an essential part of communication. And, you know, I tried to manifest that in the, you know, in the, the book itself. Oh, and speaking of Yoda, there's a quote on every page. And I have no idea how you found them all. It must have, it must have been quite an experience trying to gather the absolute perfect thing to pop on each page. But it's, I think it's every page. Almost every page. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, you know, read it for the quotes alone, people. <laughs> Even if you don't read the book, just read the quotes. It's like a, way better than Bartlett's. So, well, Jacob, thank you so much. It's great to see you and it's great to talk to you. And I'm, I'm you know, congratulations on this really terrific work. Um, thank you. So great to, to have this conversation and onward. And we're back. So this is Jacob Harold talking about the toolbox with Eric Brown. And I want to list the tools before we get started, because um, there's a lot to talk about here in terms of Jacob, his background, his career, his approach, and then how that all comes together in this uh, book he's written. But the tools are storytelling, mathematical modeling, behavioral economics, design thinking, community organizing, game theory, markets, complex systems and institutions. And Eric, he had us at hello. The very first tool <laughs> in the toolbox story is telling. storytelling. Discuss. What do you make of that? Well, well, of course, I uh, embarrassed myself as usual by talking about how my own special lens communications, I didn't like, where's the communications part in it? But the the idea that what like what he has said is that these these are many components in social change and in your work whoever you are out there listening in the wherever's world it's possible that you will be focusing on one or two or three or who knows maybe all nine of them but they are all the components of social change and and then of course he realized that there's probably more and that'll maybe go into the next book mm -hmm. but the idea that there is we we in our own minds have usually see the world through our own special lens mm -hmm. at the exclusion of these other important lenses is a really important thing to remind ourselves of. You know, we, we tend to just see the world the way we see it. And there are so many other tools that we can use in order to be able to make change. And I think that was the point of the book. That is, and, and of course, the other point is that he has given so much thought to each of these things and provided such good analysis and helpful ideas and things like that. And if, you, if you're if you not mathematical, like I am not mm. mathematical, that section might cause your head to spin in 14 directions, the mathematical modeling versions, because there are actual formulas that I do not understand. But <laughs> but he, but if, if you're in this business, you're going to learn something by seeing something that you hadn't thought about. And that's what makes this book so interesting and so cool. Well, and Jacob has had this incredible career. You know, he gets started in philanthropy. He had done other things before, but he, you know, comes to the Hewlett Foundation where he's leading a $30 million grant making initiative, right? This is not chump change that he's doing there, right? And then, and then he, <laughs> and then he leaves from that. And I always, and I always think it's so interesting to think about these transitions, you know, leaving Hewlett, then to going to GuideStar. GuideStar merges with the Foundation Center. My gosh, I'd love to, you know, put a couple drinks into Jacob and just talk Ooh, about that, right? What a process that- must have that. been interesting. And then that becomes Candid, which requires a $45 million capital raise to make that happen, which he is a key part, party in making that happen. And why can you generate, you know, $45 million to support this new institution? Because 20 million people per year use the resources that that you know Jacob is compiling and helping compile with these with these institutions and so he's had this enormous background with all this work and as i was looking at this you know set of tools it's nine of them and they're not ranked order he doesn't say number 1 is the best right he's just putting no, them out no, no, no. but i wondered if this book had been written 10 years ago or 15 or 20 years ago what tools would have been in the toolbox and i think storytelling is the number one tool 
I think that's actually something that's emerged for philanthropy at scale, something that's thought about deeply just in the last 10 years. What do you think about that? Maybe so, but storytelling in a vacuum doesn't get you where you need to Sure, go. yeah. And that's the point, I think that's the point of the book that you have to understand what markets the your work is existing in. What are the complex systems that lead to change in those in those contexts, who are the institutions that matter the most in, in terms in the, the concept of design thinking? So what is your audience? How do you think about creating programs or projects or products that that audience or whoever it is you're attempting to reach can use? Community organizing, of course, we have uh, we really understand how do you help to aggregate power in ways that it hadn't been that didn't have access to it before, and so on. So I think storytelling is one of those things that informs all of that. But you could go out and tell all the stories you want, but if you don't understand how change right. is, gets made, yep. who cares? So I think that's that. That's kind of the point of this book, and it's the point of of where Jacob has come after all all these years. Is like, oh, okay, I see how all these pieces could fit together. They don't. You don't need all nine in every single initiative you do or every project that you operate, but you have to understand how these components contribute to social change. Yeah, I, I think that, frankly, if you can't tell a good story, it's possible that you can't succeed in many of these areas because you have to be able to communicate to, to whatever audience you're trying to communicate with in ways that move them, yeah. that inspire them to action, that encourage them to engage with you and so on. So I think storytelling is, an, uh, storytelling is an important component of any important strategy. But in the absence of a real understanding of how things work, your storytelling is uh, a nice, <laughs> it won't get you there. Well, and it's it's remarkable because it's so difficult to get started, isn't, isn't it? And I think that that's sort of what's in the backdrop of this is that it's so difficult to get started we hear regularly in our travels too that it's harder to find fundable projects than it is to find money. So, you know, connecting good work to good resources is actually maybe surprisingly one of the most difficult things to do. So I almost feel like there's a missing first tool here, which is just getting started. You know, you uh-huh. just need to get started. And then and then what I took these tools to be were invitations to poke at your approach you know, test your approach given this different kind of thinking, because you're right. Like he talks about communications flows through everything, ethics and strategy flow through everything. Well, an inherent aspect of of strategy, I would say, would be to actually run your thinking against these different considerations and just ask yourself these questions. You know, are we telling stories persuasively enough? Are we actually clear about the evidence base, the math behind all this, you know, the behavioral stuff. So I loved it from that standpoint. And even from a pure communications approach, right? You're sitting in the comms team for a foundation or a nonprofit. I actually feel like you could grab these tools and think, okay, well, in what way are we actually leaning into these tools as communicators? Because these are all parts of things we should be trying to activate if we're trying to encourage social change. Yeah. Oh, I I totally agree. And uh, again, for somebody who doesn't have a facility with, say, mathematical modeling, you'll take a look at that chapter and it'll make your head spin. You might get a little nauseous and then you'll go back and go, OK, there's I actually got something out of this. <laughs> and there's just so much that we can learn. Mm-hmm. The, uh, but I want to tell you the thing that I, that I came away from my conversation with Jacob Hmm. feeling good about hmm. that. So uh, a lot of times I I you know read the paper, or I look at my work or I look at the world and I go, "Oh my god, there's so many nonprofit organizations out there and they're doing so much work spending so much money and time and effort and I think to myself, is this actually even remotely efficient? Is this <laughs> how societies should be set up in which you have to create all these rump groups that are pushing at the edges to try and make things better. Why don't we set up a system in which that stuff gets addressed in the first place? Mm. And I think, and I get a little depressed, Mm. but then Jacob, he, he said that basically there are millions of people out there. He takes solace in the fact that there are millions of people out there who are trying to make the world better. They're paid for it. We have established an infrastructure for it. And that that's going to produce something of of real value. And I, I extrapolated that a little bit to mean that we're actually going to discover and solve and address things 
that we hadn't thought of, yeah. that you can't set up to address, that having all of these millions of people out there, and I think basically everyone who's listening to this podcast is working in the nonprofit, <laughs> the social change sector, right. that you're out there working to to make the world better, however you want to define it, and you're going to do something that you hadn't thought you were going to do. Yeah. And, and that there is just no way to plan for that other than to have this universe of people who are working in that way. And so rather than having a system in which you have government solving problems and businesses making money and never the twain shall meet and that's kind of it, we have this incredibly rich third sector or fourth or fifth sector in which people are just – they, they wake up in the morning thinking about making positive change. And I, I, I honestly hadn't thought about it in that way. And that was the thing I took away from this conversation. And that man, that actually put a little spring in my step. Like, oh, wait a minute. Well, we don't live in this ridiculously, weirdly messed up society in which we have to try and plug holes from the outside and waste a lot of time and effort that this is actually going to make us better that would more than the whatever the sum of our parts. Right. No. Be, that's 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 my optimistic feel for the day. Well, and this is the benefit of people like Jacob who get to look across the entire field and come to those conclusions, right? Because he's seen the depth and breadth of it in so many different ways. And and I would see you and raise you on that. It's not even just that millions of people are doing it, but it's a real occupation. It's a real profession, and there's a real rigor to it. There's real rigor, and I think that that's what the toolbox really brings us to. It's like actually. There's rigor to what's happening, even if you're just sitting on one part of it. I'm the community organizing part of it, or you know, we work more on the complex systems of the institutions piece, or we're in the comm shop, so we're really, we're really the storytellers. There's real rigor to what's behind this, and I think that you know, when I first got started in nonprofit work, that idea was not so obvious. It was almost like you know, <laughs> nonprofit was the island. You knew there was rigor. Yeah, right. It was the island you hung out on. You know, if you were like trying to stay away from a day job. So I have a new great idea for you. Because I know oh. you just have tons of time. So, so did, didn't Thank you me. say that one of our, your close friends and one of our dear listeners, did you say he's a playwright or something like that? Yes, Marty Casella. Hey, Marty. So Marty and Eric, you guys need to work on something together because you, there was this great little exchange right in the middle, this nugget where Jacob was talking about first, you know, you don't want to fall into the trap of just like be just in one silver bullet methodology, right? You can't just fall into one. Right. But then he said, and one of the things you come to when you're at a major foundation, it, everyone comes in with their pitches yep. and you just get so used to getting pitched and pitched and pitched and pitched. In fact, that's your job is to sit at a chair and have people come in. The stakes are so high. Those people, the fact they even got your time, they've spent hours preparing. They're going to, this is like the 30 minutes, the 45 minutes. This is literally like, Hollywood pitching at its highest art, you know, coming in and trying to pitch a network, trying to pitch Netflix. Like if you've done nonprofit fundraising, you know exactly what it is to go into a, a development staff person and try to ring a bell and try to get an idea up the chain because it's going to take multiple rounds of conversation and multiple people to say yes for any penny to hit any strategy in the philanthropic space. So I want you guys to write the one act, the short story, whatever, about all of those pitches just pitch a pitch after pitch after pitch the short story that the little the play the like like what is that like because it's got to be some of the coolest human drama that you see and the and the truisms the nuances that it's almost like if we could just record a year's worth of pitches that have been made to every foundation everywhere and then play them back for everybody in philanthropy and in nonprofits i bet the quality of those meetings would get so much better because we'd realize coming in there's so much stuff you don't even need to say there's so many like ticks there's so many like the blind spots that people bring but what do you think about that like what was your experience having been pitched by 30 trillion people over the course of your tenure at a major foundation what does that turn into over time when you're when you're so used to having people come in and just pitch you on so many so many different ideas well that's that's a terrible idea, Chris. <laughs> That's all I have to say. Yeah. I mean, when you work at a foundation, people come to you with great ideas, some yeah. of which you can fund and some of which you can't. Yeah. You always learn from them if you're if you're worth anything at all. But uh I don't I don't th <laughs> I think if we if we took a um 
if if we put a database together of all the pitches in the world, I'm not quite sure that it would save <laughs> a, a lot of time or produce any uh, additional value. I I do think, however, that the idea, and we're seeing Mackenzie Scott doing this and other foundations are doing it, which is you find people whom you trust, who you think are have talent, and you give them money and let them go do their thing. Mm. And then you don't have to listen to the pitches because it's really not up to you to decide one way or the other. Mm. You find people who are talented and and give them the space they they need to be able to try things out and you hold them accountable for clarity of their approach mm -hmm. or the way they think, but you don't make them say you have to produce X number of social impact widgets in order mm -hmm. to justify another round of funding mm -hmm. because I think that that ends up producing work that doesn't go as far as it needs to go. So in that sense, I think that we should probably dispense with a lot of the pitching mm -hmm. and identify the people who are who you think have the opportunity and the ability and and whatever the access to to try things and and fund them. I I'm a big I'm I'm really seeing the value in that. I think that there's also room in philanthropy for identifying specific things that you want to address and putting together a team that works on that. But I also think that there's a lot of space and I think that's really what this book is all about is that uh, he, he uh Jacob says, seed the mind with ideas that show up later. <laughs> and I think that philanthropy has a responsibility to seed the mind mm. with ideas. And you don't exactly know what those ideas will produce, but you have some understanding that folks with kind of the right approach can produce something that will show up later. And that ought to be good enough. And I think that's, we're seeing a lot about the opportunity and the potential for philanthropy to to produce that sort of work, and I think that's exciting. And if you're in the on the receiving end of that, or if you're a, a nonprofit, then I think that these this this uh, toolkit that Jacob has provided is a great way to to continue to help you figure out how to 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 seed those ideas, <laughs> and you'll learn a lot. I certainly did, and as I said, this this book made my head hurt in a really good way, and and I was. I was delighted to have a chance to talk to Jacob about it. Yeah, it's a terrific contribution. And, you know, as we leave, I want to come back to those four ideas that he left you with. Courage, compassion, curiosity, clarity. Those are just, you know, key benchmarks. And collaboration. And collaboration. And collaboration. Five. Right? Yeah. And five C's. Very alliterative. Pretty peppy party, Pete. But good. <laughs> That's how we remember things. Courage, compassion, curiosity, clarity, collaboration. It, it, so he starts his book with a quote from Audre Lorde, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And, uh, you know, he, he talks about, we must apply new approaches to solve old problems. Otherwise only the most narrow parameters of change are possible. And th that's a warning that should echo in our minds, he says. And, and I think that this notion of courage, compassion, curiosity, clarity, collaboration, running philanthropy, running our work as, uh, as supporters of change that's a way that we can actually maybe safeguard ourselves from thinking that the master's tools are the only things that we can pick up to That's dismantle true. the house. I, th the last thing, and I, this is my last challenge I give to you and, and Jacob. Oh, geez. Here we go. C can you please come up with a different name for all of us than social change agents? Okay. I, I, I don't like any of those things. We're too, I think we're too shy to declare social, social change agents. It's an entirely neutral statement. Right, social change agent. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't inherently mean it's a good thing or a bad thing. Right, we're just yeah. in the business of change. But um, but I think that Jacobs is giving us a tremendous resource here to actually help us think more uh, systematically and more thoroughly about what we're doing. And my goodness, Jacob, what a career, what a storied career, I would say at this point for all the work that you've done and continue to do. And my goodness, I'm just so so pleased, Eric, that you brought Jacob onto the podcast. This was just an awesome conversation to listen in on. Well, it was great. And go out. I mean, folks, buy the book. Yeah. You'll need to actually have the book. It needs to sit out there because it's, it's, there's a lot to it. It's the sort of resource that you'll return to time and again. And uh, Jacob's a great guy. And I, like I say, I've known him for a long time. I inherited his office at the Hewlett Foundation. He <laughs> left his his uh, his wall O thinking, I think it was, or something. It was a whiteboard. and uh, And I would put kind of feeble attempts at thinking on it from time to time to add to <laughs> Jacob's. His work is extraordinary and 
I, I'm excited to see what he does next because he is the sort of person that philanthropy really needs. So that was Jacob Harold. The book is called The Toolbox. You can find it at jacobherald.com. Buy it, download it, read it. And um, Jacob, thank you for coming on Let's Share It. Eric, thank you for doing that. That was great. Thanks, Kirk. Bye, everybody. Okay, everybody, that's it for this episode. Please let us know if you have any thoughts about what you heard today or people we should have on this show. And that definitely includes yourself. And we'd like to thank John Ali, the tuneful and inspiring composer of our theme music. Our sponsors, the Communications Network and the Lumina Foundation. And please check out Lumina's terrific podcast, Today's Students, Tomorrow's Talent, and you can find that at luminafoundation.org. We certainly thank today's guest, and of course, all of you. And most importantly, thank you, Mr. Brown. Oh, no, 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 no. Thank you, Mr. Brown. (laughs) Okay, everybody. Till next time. Let's hear it.